Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Now, in today's episode, we're focusing on the upcoming wildfire season and wildfire preparedness in Western Canada. The official start of the wildfire season this year is March 1st. With wildfires becoming more frequent and severe, municipalities are facing big challenges in protecting their communities and resources. Now, to help us understand this issue much better, we're joined by Sean McCary, the Dean of the Emergency Training Center at Lakeland College in Vermilion, Alberta. We'll start by looking at how ready municipalities are for the upcoming wildfire season. Then we'll discuss what steps they should be taking to prepare for what is expected to be a particularly tough season compared to previous years. We'll also talk about the important role of fire departments in managing wildfires. We'll discuss how they can recruit and train firefighters, update their equipment, and support the mental well-being of all firefighters. Collaboration between municipalities and institutions like Lakeland College is key to improving firefighting practices and training future generations of firefighters. Speaking of which, we'll learn about how Lakeland College is training the next generation of firefighters to handle the challenges of wildfires. Through specialized programs and partnerships with firefighting agencies, they're equipping students with the skills they need to succeed. Our goal in today's episode is quite clear. It is to provide valuable insights and solutions to help communities and fire departments tackle the uncertainties of the upcoming wildfire season and keep everyone safe. So stay tuned as we dive deeper into this important topic. This is Municipal Affairs. Sean, I want to thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down and talking about municipalities, firefighting, and particularly this upcoming wildfire season that kicks off unofficially has already kicked off, but officially kicks off on March 1st, 2024. Before we get into the crux of the interview, I need to ask you a weird question, but it's an important one. Can you explain to me, my listeners and my viewers, who you are, what brings you here, and how you, how your role at Lakeland College makes you uh, someone who people should listen to when they're talking about the wildfire season that is upcoming? Okay, no, fantastic. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in this conversation and, and the role uh, we have here in Lakeland College in supporting municipalities um, in this, you know, upcoming battle and into the future. So um, on my side, I'm from the emergency services. Uh, traditionally, I've been in municipal government emergency services for the past 20 years. Uh, I spent time with uh, Yellowhead County, Parkland County, the city of Fort Saskatchewan, and then uh, I guess, left the fire service with Fort Saskatchewan as the fire chief and then took on a, a chief administrative officer role with the with Brazo County for just over a year and a half. And then I was snagged to come on over to Lakeland College as the dean of the emergency training center. So I myself, I'm a graduate of Lakeland College originally, and it set me up with a great foundation for municipal government um, and all the work I was able to uh, take care of and take a part of back then. And um, now look forward to, you know, sitting here at the helm for the last 18 months and making sure that we are, you know, the institution of choice and the uh, four first responders and municipalities. We're celebrating our 65th year in operation since Municipal Affairs established our institution back in 1959. And I know that coming from a first responder background and from a municipal background, I know the value and importance that those services are to a municipality is being that that person that lived that role um, and appreciate that. And so now look forward to giving back to that group with um, through this institution. I'll be honest, I, I very was quite exhausted with the first responder role and uh, but loved the fire service. Um, so this is the best of both worlds. I get to do all the fun stuff and you know, all the fun fire training and all the excitement that comes with that. But I also don't have to take the phone calls and the responses at two in the morning or three in the morning or hear about all the some of the negative side you get from the emergency services and being a first responder. So I'm really enjoying this opportunity um, and look forward to giving back to municipalities and making sure that we are the driver of that type of education. So uh, 
As we are the municipal show, I want to start by talking about municipalities for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Then we'll turn it to wildfire season and then we'll turn to the emergency tra uh, training center. But I want to start by asking you sort of a point blank question. As someone who's come from the fire services, who's worked with municipalities and is now working with municipalities in conjunction with the ETC, <clears throat> How prepared should municipalities be for this upcoming wildfire season compared to previous years? Because we all see the stats, we all see what's coming, but you can only be as prepared as you want to be because you never know exactly what's going to happen, right? Absolutely. I think that as municipalities and, and maybe even in generality for everybody is we're very quickly to forget. We always talk about lessons learned and then... We talk about it, but then does anything actually happen? So we look at last year, and I think there's many mess lessons learned last year, but quickly, I think there's many people that have already forgotten about last year. And more and more, you know, we just need to advocate stronger. And I know the fire chiefs are doing this, and, and hopefully first responders are making a big push on this. Is It's going to be equal to, if not worse, than last year, especially in Alberta, if we don't see any more participation across, you know, this province, but again, it was a national problem last year. And what uh, we thought we might have been working alone in isolation in Alberta quickly rolled into BC, and then you hear the East Coast going nuts. Um, so it's, it's I think, a national problem we're going to see again this year, and I think it's going to be bigger. And the other challenge that we've been very, very fortunate so far um, is that we have lost a lot of infrastructure over the last few years in, in many municipalities. We can imagine, you know, Slave Lake, I know uh, near and dear to yourself and, and Fort McMurray and other places in, in BC. Um, but very fortunately in Canada, we haven't seen, you know, the life loss um, as other countries have. And I think that's, um, I'm fearing that day is going to be the trigger to actually do something about this and get really aggressive with some strategies and put some horsepower behind it. Um, but, I'm, you know, it shouldn't have to come to that. So I know this year is going to be very busy and very stressful on everybody. And it's going to be, you know, in the eyes of, of the elected officials and the CAOs and all of that. But um, quickly, as coming from the emergency services, once the doors client close on the fire station, people quickly forget. And that, again, you don't need to know and you don't need to worry about the fire department until you call them. Um, so you hope that when they do come, they're prepared. But you're really quickly forgotten. Even when I went into Brazo County as a CAO, it's a good, I can go in and I can really make a good push to get them prepared in emergency management and the fire services. And I quickly found out again with um, different priorities and the municipality and of council that that was very much pushed to the bottom and, you know, roads, weeds, ditches, drainage, all of that stuff gets a priority because it's in your face every, every day. But um, otherwise, emergency services, if you don't hear or see them, you quickly forget about them. And I think this year is going to be a bit of a rude awakening, I think, um, with uh, making sure we are all prepared as municipalities. I think the other piece is be prepared for the long haul. A wildfire is not one or two days. A uh, wildfire can be 10, 20, 30, 45 days. And uh, your municipal um, employees can only survive so long on, on adrenaline and in their preparedness. And many municipalities don't have the staff, as you can imagine, to run 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, 96, and, and, and weeks into it. Uh, so a lot of regional partnerships and a lot of regional collaboration um, needs to happen. And uh, um, I really hope a lot of those conversations are already happening um, and, the, and the readiness on the municipal side to help support all the municipal staff that are going to have to be on the front lines to, to be prepared for this year. So I, I just have a clarification on something that you said just in that statement there. You said the loss of uh, infrastructure equipment. Are you talking about aging out or are you talking about actual loss of infrastructure equipment from wildfires in previous years? Because those are two different things. And aging out of infrastructure is quite a scary thing for a lot of firefighters who are potentially going to be going into the, uh, the front lines of battling these wildfires as they start popping up over the next few weeks. And as of recording, there is already seeing some underground burns that are already relighting. Absolutely. So I think there's a couple pieces there. Primarily what I meant in those cases was the infrastructure and communities, like uh, your, just your buildings and your you know public works building and like Slave Lake, I know lost their, their, um, their uh, town hall. Thing. Yeah, town office. So some of that, we've lost a lot of buildings in the last number of fires. And again, same thing in this case, old aging infrastructure 
um, lots of old aging fire equipment throughout the, the country as well. And I wish I had the information, but the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs has also done a big fire service census in, in across Canada. And again, the trends there are showing that our first responder average age is higher than it probably should be. So again, you're now relying on people in those communities that are quite a bit older and we're not seeing that influx of newer, younger people also to fill that gap as well. So um, there's there's lots of different factors in that. As someone who's on the front lines, as, as someone who is training the future generations to go out and battle these wildfires and every other fire that comes along with the uh, emergency services, is there any improvements and notable improvements that you have seen in your time as dean of the emergency training center that you say if municipalities want to get serious about the future of firefighting and the future of wildfire fighting firefighting they need to start looking at x y and z or is it an ever-changing evolving scenario where what's good in brazo county may not be a good a, a good fit for an infrastructure program or an infrastructure pro, uh, uh, utility up in slave lake or even in peace county oh that's a, that's a fantastic question i think that in, in alberta specifically we've seen some of the resources be pulled away and uh, the money that was available for the wildland the true wildland firefighting response in alberta um and then more push like on the municipalities need to make sure that their stuff is there but i think one of the changes are well i'd also say that i think traditionally our programs have stayed relatively um, simple, if that makes sense. Like, I think there's a lot more use and education that we can be doing in more innovative ways to do, educate people, and especially in uh, e-learning and remote atmosphere. So I think there's always infrastructure and dollars that can and would be or should be invested in that to do a better product, to produce a better student at the end. Um, so I'd say just that alone, absolutely, we can make investments there for sure. I think also relying on post-secondary institutions to help um, provide some of that training. Uh, traditionally in the province of Alberta, a, you're relying on on Alberta wildfire and they're, they're training a lot of their own stuff, but a lot of their curriculum is owned and managed through them. Whereas we can be relying on other institutions to also support that, that type of training and, and do a, a, a bigger approach to it, get more people trained, get more municipalities and first responders trained in that. The other big thing that we're seeing probably just in the last 12 ish, 24 months and other areas of the world do this really well, but we're just catching up. Um, we're starting to open the door to this. I understand it and I believe and kind of the hesitation behind it, but is using uh, residents in a municipality to, to help you. And lots of times, um, traditionally in the past, it was put the brakes on, don't let them do anything, just get them out of the way so no one gets hurt. Well, now they kind of flip the script on that and saying, okay, people are gonna stay. And if they do have resources, let's not tell them what they can't do. Let's tell them what they can do. And I think by changing that perspective is gonna help a lot. But then we also have to make sure that we're educating them because there is that liability piece. But if we educate them to do a good job um, or a reasonable job in safe situations, they can probably be very effective in this. I was just having a chat with another fire chief or a colleague of mine on this very much this morning. And if you don't educate the people and they start to come out and help you, they can actually be counterproductive. So they can actually get themselves in harm way first off, but they can be doing things that are actually, you know, hindering your um, tactic and strategy in, in putting out the fire. So if we can put some good educational material out to um, to people or residents that are going to stay behind and make sure that they understand the risks involved, um, it I think is going to be effective. Um, I can see, I know Yellowhead County and Parkland County both taken steps to do this just recently in, in educating popular or their general residents to be able to help out. And I think if we do that in a good way, and uh, I think it can be effective. Um, and then hopefully more and more municipalities do pick up on that and start to enable residents to help out in the right ways. And then again, the other big program that I know municipalities have been dabbling in for many years, but have not, not many have been able to put a lot of resources into is just the Fire Smart programs. Um, we have a really great program in Canada. Um, it's just, we need very big, strong ambassadors in that. I know some of our mountain communities have taken uh, the big leaps in that, but I think more of our rural um, prairie municipalities need to as well is get behind Fire Smart, put some resources behind it. Again, uh, it's that, you know, you put that penny and it's going to save you a million dollars later on. So it's a tough investment because I get it. It costs you now again, it can save you millions later. But I think that's a big push is to get behind the Fire Smart one and, and get it done. The other piece, 
that I've always been very interested in is seeing how insurance companies start to step up. I know in California, for example, um, if you are not re uh, you know rated in a certain fire smart category on your property, you will not get insurance um, because it's too much of a risk. They're not taking you on. I'm curious, again, if we're ever going to see that. I don't know, again, all the, the rules behind, and the legalities behind insurance companies in Canada. That's not my expertise for sure. But I think once you start to see the losses continue to stack up, is somebody going to stand up and say something like, hey, we're not going to insure you in these cases or whatever it might be. But insurance companies are also maybe the driver in, in affecting change. I'm going to ask a political question here right now, and I apologize for throwing it in so early, but you, you're talking about some of the vulnerabilities that residents, insurance companies, municipalities will be going through over the next few months. Um, here in Alberta, because we are at the Alberta-based show talking about municipalities, but we do have listeners across Canada, particularly in Western Canada, Saskatchewan and Alberta particularly, we're seeing drought conditions worsen. And you are you are not a fire chief right now, but you have been one in the past and you are speaking with fire chiefs across uh, your area. Is this a real concern right now for fire chiefs that when the wildfire season does start and it is if it is as bad as it is expected to be, the drought condition is going to potentially exacerbate it by a putting more fuel to the fire in some sense, but also B, potentially having water run out and we'll have to go down the road or 30 kilometers down the road to fill up to ensure that we have the adequate water supply to fight these fires. Absolutely. I think that that's going to be a major concern in the next number of weeks here as, as spring does start to hit us and we see what that real picture looks like. Um, I, I would say that what else are we going to fight the fire with as simple as that? Like in the absence of water, what are you going to do other than let it just burn? Um, with, there's advantages, I guess, to that too. But um, if you're expecting fire departments and your helicopters and your water bombers and all of that to use water to put up the fire or control the fire, um, and there's a substantial lack of it, it's going to be a very stressful time. And it's going to put more pressure on even more municipalities that may have the water to get it out of there and to get it available elsewhere. So uh, I think that's going to be a battle for all of us to fight, whether you are not involved in a wildfire or not. I think that's going to be a very much a provincial problem um, to help us manage that. Um, and I know they're already talking about um, a lot of regionalization and collaboration agreements already when it comes to water, um, just in preparation for that. But uh, even at the fire school here, we said the same thing is that we're relying on water to do our training. And what's our contingency plan if we are not allowed to access water? Uh, that'll put a big wrinkle in our plans for the summer. Um, but understand, of course, that uh, it's got to go to the front lines. So yeah, um, that makes me really nervous. Like you said, is we're going to need a lot of water. Um, it, it's simple as that. I don't imagine anything else we could use um, that's going to be very effective in the absence of water. I, I, hope, I don't know. That's probably not the best answer, but uh, it's. I think it's going to be a provincial struggle, uh, a big one. How much, how important is it for regional collaboration over the next few months between different fire departments and more regional approaches to these firefighters? Because uh, I, I know that last year the uh, Lakeland College and the ETC did help out in some locations throughout Alberta fighting on the front lines of these fire uh, fights, on these wildfires. How important will you be what will you be looking for when it comes to this regional approach to sort of attacking these wildfires as they continue to pop up absolutely i think that first and foremost we're going to have to rely on our neighbors uh right away uh, i've always been a strong advocate with that when it comes to emergency management and evacuations is likely when you have a wildland fire and you're trying to evacuate people just get them out of your municipality make them somebody else's problem and i say that kind of jokingly but if, if I'm in Stony Plain, for example, and I can send my people out of my municipality and send them to Edmonton, they become Edmonton's problem. And Edmonton is also not trying to battle a wildfire. So take on your responsibility as the wildfire, get your people out and, and let somebody else support them. 
that's I think one of the easiest strategies. Hopefully, you know, your neighbors are willing and able to do that. But if they don't have the, the big fight on their hands about the disaster, they're likely willing to step up. But again, same with that exhaustion with staff and being able to try to do everything yourself for the first 72 hours, 96 hours, so on and so forth, you're going to find out really quick you can't do that. So you're going to be relying on neighbors. Um, I always enjoyed calling in people to come and help in the emergency operations center when I was in Parkland County, for example, at a couple different incidents. Because again, it helps regional preparedness as well. It gets people the exposure in to come and help, gets them working with your team, um, aids in the next emergency. So I think we're going to rely on that a lot. Uh, we were very fortunate this year, or in this past year, uh, through relationships that I was able to offer resources and, and equipment and students, like you highlighted there, to head out to assist Parkland County in their wildfire fight, which was great because our, our resources are not tied up by a municipality and we're not, and municipality is not expecting our help or relying on our help. So when we go and help, it doesn't cause any extra wrinkles anywhere doesn't put extra stress on another municipality because you've lost resources to go and help somebody else, um, which was great. And it was great experience for my students and our program and things like that. But it was just a, a relationship driven. I kind of jokingly sent a message over to their fire chief and said, hey, just, you know, we're thinking about you. We've got resources if you need them. And it was like the next very day I said, can you honestly, can you guys can come out and help? I said 100 percent. We'll, we'll see what we can do. And we were able to make that happen. But uh, I highlight, and if, if municipalities don't have collaboration agreements or, or cooperation agreements of some sort, I, I definitely appreciated working in the Edmonton metro region where we had the, um, what it was the um, Capital Region Emergency Preparedness Partnership. So it was an agreement behind the scenes that essentially, in a nutshell, said that, you know, an emergency of any type, we can rely on anyone in this group to rely or, you know, share resources uh, across the board. And it was this overarching agreement that applied on everything. And it was just great. So we knew if it was just simple. I didn't have to try to reestablish relationship with St. Albert or Leduc or um, Sherbrooke, or I guess Strathcona County or anything. We just had that in the background. So when, when crap hit the fan, I could call on any of those, I think it was 23 municipalities at the time that back then that signed it, and rely on any of them for anything essentially. Um, but that was already figured out beforehand. Um, it's really tough that day of, and you're trying to figure that out and, and come up with some collaboration deal while you're, you know, things are burning down. So those multi-partnership exchange agreements on resources are really important to get in place ahead of time if you don't have them now. You talked about the uh, the emergency command center, sort of volunteer, the staff members who come in work, having a regional approach to that aspect to make sure that people get some time off. But firefighters are a unique blend. Firefighters, there's there's not an abundance of firefighters out here in Alberta who are going to be able to fight these fires. We do bring in outside uh, help from Ontario, from other countries do come in. I know that we've just sent some down to Chile to help with their wildfire uh, combat too. But I've got to ask, what can municipalities do during a wildfire to ensure that there is no burnout from their firefighters because they're they are the brave they're the ones running into the fire they are the ones running into the fire to protect our houses our livelihoods and they're the ones on the front line seeing very devastating things on a side on a regular basis what can municipalities do what can councils do to ensure that the firefighters feel like they're not just being used as a tool to fight fires but a partner in a municipality to help keep it safe absolutely that that's a great question and and one thing i would just add to that maybe that complexity in, in these situations is many municipalities in canada are relying on your traditional volunteer paid on call firefighters so um, a number of municipalities, we've been very fortunate to have full-time staff um, that you can rely on that come in and do their shift and go home. And whereas the bulk majority, the vast majority of us are relying on either augmented models or, or solely handing over our emergency services to paid on-call volunteer style employees. And um, the other thing, they have to go back to work on Monday. Like they have their regular jobs. And I think that that in some cases is forgotten too, that we can, we can run these people until they're exhausted and then they're done kind of thing. And in most 
most first responders will go until the job is done. So even that, you have to force them to put the brakes on. You have to force them to go home. But again, if that fire is done at midnight on Sunday, guess who's getting up at six in the morning to go back to work, the real job, and it's it's them. So I think first off, the, the piece of appreciation, and, and that's the challenge. Everybody feels appreciated in many different ways. And what might satisfy one person, another person might not. So that's it's always tough. I think the uh, just, you know, recognition and support throughout the year is a big one. And, and it's not just at the end of a wildfire or not just after the big emergency is that kind of that year round appreciation piece. I know the other one that um, the the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs is also doing, and I hope this this helps the system, is that they're advocating strongly to have that the tax rebate for first responders increased as well. Uh, to, I believe it's that $10,000 mark. So I'm hoping that also helps. Um, and if municipalities find that there's value in there, that's probably a conversation that's that's great to support to, uh, to be able to help behind the scenes to our first responders. Um, but it, I don't, I don't even know if I have a really good answer for this one. Um, like you said, we're first responders work really hard and we'll go until absolute like exhaustion and, and they'll travel all over to go. I look at the effort on how many people went to the Northwest territories last year to help out. And I just looked at, I was exhausted just watching them and I was sitting from here like, um, but you know, they'll, they'll run until they're, you know, until, yeah, until failure kind of thing. So um, I think being able to support your emergency operations center in an emergency and support the leadership in there to get the resources um, and to build and bring in your neighbors um, so that there is less stress on the uh, first responders so they feel like they can take a day off is important. Uh, I know um, talking with Parkland County after our deployment there, they said by having our 27 staff come out and join them, they were able to send some people back home for a day or two days and get some rest and reset and then come back out when we left. So just that little bit, they were able to release the reins a little bit and, and people could come back then a little refreshed uh, a few days after the point. I, I've worked for a municipality. I know that uh, once a year they usually do a sort of ad mock emergency uh, through emergency preparedness week. Um, for the upcoming wildfire season, we could be a few weeks away from the actual height of it. We could be a month. We could be two months. We don't know exactly when the sort of the eye of the storm is going to hit. What proactive steps, if they haven't already started, I'm hoping they have, what proactive steps should municipalities and fire departments be taking right now as of recording this and as of this airing to ensure they can sort of address the height of the wildfire season and sort of stop the major risks anticipated for this upcoming dry season? Oh, I think there's there's many pieces to this on in here. Did you that... talk about fire smart, which is a very important aspect of this entire thing. And for those who want to learn more, the link will be in the show notes if you want to learn more about fire smart and how you can fire smart your property. There's my little plug there. Continue, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one of the managers of fire smart is um laura and and she's a fantastic lady so I, i'll make sure she gets a copy of this she'll appreciate this shout out she's a lovely but um oh yeah there's lots to this one i think yeah anything you can do on prevention side if, if you could go after and then support and push fire smart great um i would make sure it's, it's call out to the elected officials listening in it is many of them or or all of council as a whole are likely on some sort of emergency management committee and start asking those questions in, the, in those sessions and, and asking, you know, your level of preparedness and your, you know, your state of emergency response um, for this year. Um, and then making sure, you know, just being aware of what's going on, I think is going to be a big one and what's going on provincially. Keep an eye on that. And traditionally in the past, I think Alberta is usually the start point when it comes to wildland fires. They'll start here and then every other province kicks up afterwards. So if I was in BC or Saskatchewan or any other province, I'd be keeping a close eye on Alberta. And if Alberta's bad um, this year again, as we saw last year, everybody else turned out to be bad. We uh, we seemed to start up about a month early last year than everybody else did. So it'll be a good uh, heads up if it, if it looks ugly. Um, the other one, I guess, I was just trying to think there, the other piece to this one, um, I think probably have your, um, well, I, I would 
I would also encourage any elected officials and the, you know, say like the rural municipalities of Alberta or Alberta municipalities or, or even FCM kind of thing, the, the big conglomerate groups um, that can be very vocal and push are those the ones that I think are going to have to stand up as also and and make sure that the provinces and federal government are engaged in this conversation because again, like I said, we are quick to forget about things. I think most everybody has a pretty good look at this year and know that it's going to be a concern but again if this year leads into next year like have make sure the provinces and the, the federal government are having those conversations and that they're important to the the the, the associations can, can uh, i, I, can I challenge you a little bit on that there for a second sean yeah 100 percent, please okay you're right people have a very short memory right now we we live in a very 24-hour news cycle and we live in a very isolated news cycle as well People down in southeastern on uh, Alberta don't remember the wildfire season this year because they didn't see the wildfire season this year. They people in Edson will remember it this year because they were the on the front lines and they got evacuated. Wildfire season hits Fort McMurray, Slave Lake. They're going to remember it because they have lived that lived experience. How do we? How do we? How do we get people to care about something that doesn't affect them? Like you said, as long as the fire truck is sitting in the fire hall, we're comfortable. When I pick up the phone and I call, I want that fire truck to be at my uh, place if I have an emergency. How do we get people to care outside of that sort of thinking, that linear thinking of as long as I call them and they arrive, that's all I care about? So I think the, the first thought that comes to my head is uh, I'll go back to that stance on we're quick to forget. I mean, absolutely. If a wildfire comes in and starts to threaten Fort McMurray and Slave Lake, 100 percent, they'll be they'll know what that feels like and know what the, the crap that that brings for sure. But my thought is, again, did any of them or did the vast majority of people better prepare themselves now that so when that fire comes in, they're ready to go. They're like they're personally prepared to evacuate the town again. Mm, I, I'd be curious to know if that was like factual, if that was a big, if if they could effectively evacuate with everything you need this time and not the crazy stuff that a lot of people packed in a crazy amount of urgency when they had to get out of those areas. But did they do any steps? Did the municipalities really take any proactive steps to better prepare so there's not a problem or was it quickly forgotten? Absolutely. That fire comes in. It's going to create as much, you know, excitement. That might not be the word I want to use as much chaos as, as it did back then. But will it, again, have we quickly forgotten about it already? Because, again, it's, I always think it's gambling. Like, it's 1% chance that this is ever going to happen in my municipality. And, and then you do get caught one day. But I'm going to probably spend the money on the 99% chance stuff that happens all the time. And banking on that 1%, in certain cases, pardon the pun, people get burned on that that wild off chance. But I think that's, a, that's an approach we take to a lot of emergency services, like, uh, a tornado could hit there, but what's the likelihood of it actually happening? Well, very, very rare. Um, so we probably don't have to invest very much time and effort into that. But then that one day does come and it does happen. So I think that's where we all often forget and don't learn from what has happened. Um, but absolutely, like you said, geographically, um, what happens in northern Alberta does, doesn't really matter to the border, like to the Medicine Hat area or anything like that, or even you know, federally. Um, I know none of it. We were talking with a, a government official from up there the other day. They don't have any worry about in the world about wildland fires, but Northwest Territories, absolutely, they do. They saw that last year. Um, so, yeah, I, I I don't know if I have a good answer for this one. The uh, 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 I think understandable people just being vocal, like the yeah, being vocal and being the squeaky wheel, I guess, and and to those municipalities like Brazo County, and Edson, and Hinton and rocky mount house and all those um it they're under threat from this and i think it's they're just gonna have to yeah be as vocal as they can and hope that their peers and other municipalities do support them in that i want to turn to the role of the firefighter here for a second and the state of the firefighter field if you don't mind for a few seconds and i, I as someone who's been on the front lines is now training the next generation of firefighters are you seeing it as a profession that more and more people are going into or not going into? And what should organizations like yourself, the Emergency Training Center, and municipalities do to ensure that 
when we do age out of our current crop of firefighters, we do have replacement firefighters that can come in and replace those people who have been on the front lines for 20, 25, 35 years. I'm, I'm, I'll say first off, what was fascinating to me is the federal government has actually recognized this and uh, they put out a, a grant program from uh, Natural Resources Canada um, to to invest money into wildland firefighting and a specific stream was for exposure and hitting Canadian youth on educating that this is a career opportunity, that there is work here and very likely will be work for a very, very long time. Um, but we, like I said, we applied on that, that stream of funding is to put forward a very creative program to go out and educate youth that this is a field. So um, in my eyes, again, I think our, our grant for this or there, our application for the program, I think, is an innovative approach that we can go out and start to have a lot of those conversations with youth. So I applaud the, you know, the federal government being able to recognize that and then put some money behind that. Um, I would love and, and would love to challenge the provincial governments as well to do very much the same. I thought it was fascinating that the federal government did this and actually they started this a grant program last year. Um, so saying, wow, you were actually kind of a almost a year-ish ahead of where um, where I suspected these conversations would start um, in response to last year. So that was creative and, and good on them for being able to recognize and invest in that. Um, but I also, I think one of the challenges we have in recruiting and retaining these, these individuals or youth getting into this field is it's seasonal work, unfortunately, right? It's not full-time work. There are some full-time positions, of course, with um, forestry and wildland firefighting, but not a lot of them. They rely on seasonal employees. So you're starting that April and going till October. So that window of work is thin. So I think there's also a, a there's not only a shortage in workforce, I think we, we see everywhere, but then there's even a bigger shortage on people that are only can and are willing to work that, that seasonal work piece. And then either, you know, they made enough money to survive over the winter to get back on, um, the next season or long, um, but, or if not, what do you do in the winter? So I think you're really narrowing that market down of people. But again, if you're going to hire them <laughs> all year round, as all of us in municipalities appreciate, that's going to double your cost because um, now they're full-time people and you're going to pay them 365. So uh, I think the system is- are, are, are people going into the field in 2024 still? Like, are you, are you seeing an uptick in people applying for training classes through the emergency training center, wanting to be firefighters, whether it be just part-time firefighters or wildfire firefighters at Lakeland College, or are you seeing sort of a steady pace over the last few years? I know, uh, for clarification's sake, for anyone who's listening, uh, I was going to call you Dean, but no, you are a Dean, and your name is Sean. Sean has, was hired as the Dean of the ETC in 2022, so he's only been there for about 18 months, as he said. I just want to know if there's been a steady incline, steady sort of plateau, or if you're sort of seeing ebbs and flows as we traditionally do in every other field. Absolutely. And and I think that there's still a, a strong demand for that or a strong demand for people coming in, entering that career, because there's that desire, um, especially with wildland fire, outdoor work. Um, it, it's great. Like, I think that environment, that excitement, that teamwork, that exposure to some really cool things and being working in nature is desirable. A number of our students that came through our programs this year have already been retained by wildland firefighting companies. Um, they're likely still in pursuit of municipal style um, full-time work. So until they get that, they'll do the wildland firefighter game kind of thing. Um, but I know that some people do get, I don't mean, I don't mean this negatively, but get sucked into the wildland um, programs and they really enjoy it for a few of those things I just touched on. So I'd say the market's been pretty stable on, on like, new students coming in. Uh, the other thing that we've seen over the last you know, 10, 12 years is more private sector businesses getting into the world of fire training as well. So you have a lot more fire or sorry, private institutions training firefighters um, versus public. There is only a handful of public, true public institutions in, in Canada, um, but more private companies getting into the game too. And, and I would think that with more private companies getting into the game, and being able to sustain all of these different operations going that uh, that's a i think a positive sign on the number of students i still like students coming to lakeland 
um, and and because I think there's value in that um, and being a public uh, post-secondary institution, um, that sort of thing. Uh, so I definitely want to you know continue marketing and promoting our institution. Of course, um, again, we're very fortunate to have the largest uh, training institution in Canada for what we do. So I think students get a grander experience coming here. Um, but yes, I think that it's a very desirable career. Um, like I said, I think there's a couple of those challenges operationally how they do it. Um, but I think if we have, um, if the work is there, I think you do have lots of students that do want to go out, um, get employed, get working in this industry with the hopes of likely getting into a career later on. But uh, without those, well, I guess with those unique pieces, I think there's still um, a good chunk of workforce that does want to go out and do that. You talk about students, but I've got to ask because I'm going to poke the bear, uh, the proverbial bear for a second, if you don't mind. Um, is the emergency training center just for students or is it for municipalities to say, maybe we should go do some training for our firefighters? Maybe we should look at ways we can improve our frontline staff to ensure that when an emergency comes up, they are best prepared and utilized. Because unfortunately, not everyone has an unlimited supply of money municipally because they can't run deficits, so they can't do the training in person for themselves. As we have listeners across Western Canada and around Canada, does your organization, does Lakeland College allow for municipalities to say, hey, we have five firefighters who want to go do some training, whether it be X, Y, or Z, can you guys accommodate? Absolutely. The I'll, I'll just maybe start really briefly and quickly on students. We have students from all over Canada come in. Um, we had a student from Whitehorse. We had a student from Labrador. Um, they come from all over the place. And um, because we've been in the game so long here in like the 65 years, we were very, very well known and, and our institution is very well respected. And again, thankfully, because municipal affairs in Alberta established us back in the 50s. Um, so great legacy, all of that. And a number of municipalities do use us. Uh, we were heavily relied on from the um, from that 50s until the early 2000s uh, as being the complete municipal resource on training for in, in the province of Alberta. So whether it be distance learning or education offsite, we facilitated probably you know 90 percent of that in the province of alberta um we were a big support that was our that was why we were here kind of thing and i still have that view today is that we were set here to support municipalities as a fire chief in my time as well i would send or do the push to send staff and resources out here to train versus us taking on um you know, building our own infrastructure or training schools or anything like that, because again, resource wise and financially wise, it would have been nearly impossible to do, or we would have had to cut corners would put us at risk. It was easier for me to send them on the road out to Lake Lake College to spend time in, you know, proper infrastructure, proper resources, and to get it done safely. And then I don't take on very much liability. So now coming here, same thing is have that attitude is try to make sure that people understand and are educated on how we can support that we are here, um, that you can come out uh, and use our infrastructure. You can come out and send people on specific courses that are required, or we have also custom opportunities as well that we will uh, will travel. We've uh, been able to do opportunities all over the world over the last 20 to 30 years as well, um, and continue to look forward to uh, a few other international opportunities, hopefully coming up this year. Um, but essentially, um, that's my motivation is uh, from the municipal side. I want to help the municipal side as the best we can, um, because you said money's tight. Um, these people are, you know, giving it their all. I want to make sure they're safe and resourced and um, don't want the worst to happen. So whatever we can do to help them um, and help municipalities be prepared, that's what I want to make sure that we're well known for that and that we're seen that way across Canada, if that makes sense. It does. And it begs the question because we always think about training after the fact, right? We always think about, oh, we should have trained a little bit harder on this area, or we should have trained a little bit harder on uh, prescribed burns, making sure that we do it in the correct area. Does Lakeland College and the ETC sort of designate each program to what the municipality is looking for? Or is there ways that it's a one size fits all? Because like I said at the beginning of the interview, uh, what's is, the issues that uh, wildfires are going to have up in Brazo County are not going to be the same up in Northern Lights County or even in uh, Minden, Minburn County, the county of Minburn, if I get that one right. I apologize to the county. They are great. I shouldn't make fun of them, but I always get their name wrong. Um, so do you... Uh, sort of adhere each program to what the requirements are, or is it a one-size-fits-all sort of approach? 
Absolutely. It's kind of, I would say maybe best of both worlds is that most of our training is, is built around uh, what we call the National Fire Protection Association standards. So they have a standard of what a wildland firefighter should know and should what be able should be able to do. They have a standard on also like a municipal structural type firefighter, what they should and should know and what they should be able to do. So a lot of our training accommodates those standards, which then allow us also there, those are sealed standards, much like a, a tradesperson would get kind of thing is once you've accomplished that, you'll get your seal and accreditation to that. So many of our programs are like that. Um, the challenge with that, of course, is it has to be general to the most part, like that's a North American standard. So like you said, we're now trying to accommodate people that live in Seattle or Toronto or, you know, Whitehorse or Edson or Medicine Hat. So it can be very much generic and also relies on textbooks and things that are produced at that, ne at that North American level as well. Uh, with that being said, we do try to bring in a lot of our supportive material and resources to help the the Canadian version of it kind of thing. And then based on custom solutions or whatever it might be, we can get more local. We actually just ran a industrial fire training course or industrial firefighter course last week. That was specifically what we called the Canadian winter edition. Um, it was the first time we ventured into really fire training in the cold and in the winter here, but saying that's what we do for, you know, unfortunately 60% of the year, it's going to be cold. So let's get to work kind of thing. So we did uh, modify some of our curriculum to do that. Um, I think at the pre-employment programs like that, it, we do try to keep them fairly generic because every department is going to be different too. When they join that fire department, whether it be Edmonton or Spruce Grove or Calgary or you know, Regina, whatever it might be, uh, they're going to get some custom training for their, their, station and their operation and how their municipality runs and the different hazards they have there as well. Um, but also on top of that, we have um, one of Canada's only, you know, emergency service focused degree programs as well that a lot of fire service and emergency service leaders have undertaken to prepare them to be that fire chief officer role as well. So um, I think our curriculum is, is pretty solid. I'm aspiring to continue to elevate the bar here and make things even better and, and more focused on what we need locally, locally being Canada and, and in Alberta and even even more so. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing up the bar and everything we've got. Now, we have a lot of mayors and CAOs and administration who listen to this show across Canada, not just Alberta, but across Canada. Um, I could probably ask you a thousand other questions, but I'm going to sort of flip the script a little bit. What would you want mayors and the CAOs to know about training about the emergency training center that if I don't ask, you'll be upset about. So what is the thing that you wish if you had about a hundred CAOs and mayors in a room tomorrow, what's the one thing that you would want them to take away about what your program offers municipalities, what your program does for municipalities and where the future is sort of heading with the role of the firefighting wildfires and, uh, uh, sort of the state of uh, firefighting in 2024. Absolutely. Oh, that's a good one. I would say uh, my my first and foremost idea that comes to my head is be aware of the amount of operational and capital costs it has running your own training facility and your own training programs. Um, I It's funny how I land in this position. I never wanted a training ground or anything to do with that because I knew the liability and the operating costs. That was not something I ever wanted to get into. I would have rather taken all of those dollars and put it into operational response dollars, get the fire trucks there faster um, and better um, than invest in the training background. And I would have rather sent people out than having to wait, you know, spend all that money on infrastructure myself. So that's why I've always leveraged this institution um, and what we had. Um, fortunately, um, we have you know water treatment facilities. We have our own. We take care of everything. We've got all of our infrastructure. We have you know twenty one full time staff here that run this this our training our school here. So it's great. Use us or other places to take on that that hard work for you and don't you know put your money to better things if that makes sense operation or to invest in sending people out for training you look at the industrial groups like the like anybody all the big plant operators up in fort mcmurray and all of that you ask them how many of them those multi-billion dollar companies how many of them actually have their own training facilities versus sending people out they send a lot of people out to here to lakeland college or they send them to texas um 
And ultimately they have billions of dollars. They've chosen to send them out because they don't want the liability and they don't want the cost. It's just cheaper to operate the other way. So I'm a big believer in that. Um, the other thing that I hope municipalities do recognize is that the amount of first responder cancers uh, that we are seeing and how much that's going to play a, a factor in a lot of discussions coming up and a lot of mental health challenges as well, I think are the big ones. Okay, you said the C word and I have to play in that sandbox because as someone who has battled cancer, I can tell you it is horrible. What are the resources that are available publicly? And I know I'm putting you on the spot here for a second here, Sean, but I think I need to. Um, what are the resources that municipalities can sort of look at to ensure that firefighters are not left in the lurch if they do get cancer from fighting fires, which we are seeing, a, like you said, a high increase or uh, resources available for municipalities to ensure that their firefighters who are struggling with PTSD from going into fires, from seeing the aftermaths of the fire are properly utilized. Absolutely. I think the, the municipalities that have been proactive in this have invested money into uh, to testing early, uh, like can pre pre-cancer testing with a lot of full-time departments have taken this on. Um, I would encourage and support other municipalities that don't have the full-time to also make those services available to, to your paid on-call employees as you can. Um, but that's where uh, they're going to go out to a clinic, get tested, get the pre-cancer uh, pre or pre-screening done. So if they do get something, you can catch it at that stage zero, stage one, and get it dealt with and versus the other way around. If you catch it later, uh, it's worse. And then you imagine the organizational challenges when you have you know, a death, unfortunately, like that. There's going to be lots of negative, negative side to that. So you can invest the front end. That's the, that's the best way. So I applaud many municipalities that have already undertaken that, that pre-screening effort. The other challenge is, like we said, is, is the there's no good answer to this yet, but, you know, with the um, PFAS is the big one right now that everybody's been talking about, and it's in our bunker gear. It's in the personal protective equipment that firefighters are wearing. So that's a big one. Like, that's a big challenge for us. So you've been wearing this carcinogenic product while you're doing your job, also breathing in carcinogenic products. And, and then you start to realize, well, wonder why cancer is so bad um, in the first responder world or in firefighters. It's like, well, they've been wearing it and they've been breathing it in kind of thing. So it's it's a real dog's breakfast, if I can say it that way. So I think the the next thing is one, one there's solutions that start to come out on, on getting away from some of these things is I think municipalities need to be rapid adopters of whether it be new cleaning standards or new equipment um, to get away from this stuff. Um, as quickly as we can. Um, but again, that's going to take some money. Again, a, a set of bunker gear, like a, the personal protective equipment a firefighter is going to wear, that's going to be $2,500 to you know $5,000 a unit for pants and a jacket nowadays. And if you have to replace all of that for 30 people, that can be very expensive for a municipality. If you have to replace, replace that for 2,500 employees, that's you know, that's a lot of coin uh, to be cashing out. So it's the, the willingness and ability to you know, be an early adopter of some of this stuff if we can. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, it's going to be a, a challenge. And I hope that research, more research and more things come out of this quickly. And then mental health is just making sure that you guys are speaking positively towards this. I think there's many people, many advocates in the emergency service world, and in the general population, that are continuing to try to break down the walls and the barriers and the, the stigmas around it. We're, we've introduced a couple different strategies here as well with the new, you know, with our students trying to normalize that conversation right out the gate. Um, but continue just to you know speak positively about mental health, making sure that um, there's resources there, but also making sure it's not one of those you're talking about it, but your actions aren't doing anything. Um, is if you're going to support the programs, make sure you're supporting it, and that there's you know also no ramifications when something does happen. I think there's that too, is that people will come out and say something, but then we are, you know hesitant to bring them back and, and reincorporate them um, as well. So it, mental health is also a big thing. I think we still got a lot of room to grow and understand and uh, and support one another in it. And I appreciate the, you know, the many advocates that are out there and the ambassadors that are doing a great job on trying to break down those walls. Now, I'm cautious of time here, and I want to turn to the future, if you don't mind, for a few seconds. 
Um, we, we talked about the state of the wildfire season coming up. We've talked about uh, the state of the fire departments, the state of firefighters. Um, what will you be watching over the next few weeks, over the next few months, as we get into the uh, height of the wildfire season here in Alberta? And I say here in Alberta because let's, I just want to pinpoint that and then we'll go Canada right afterwards. Absolutely. I think one of the things I'm most interested in watching is that we're going to see the budget in Alberta come out uh, fairly quickly here. And I'm I'm curious what we did learn from last year, what the provinces recognized, where they need to invest their dollars and what's really important uh, will be you know quickly told to us in the next few weeks kind of thing as, as we go that way. So I think that'll be very clear on on that. Um, also, I think this drought is going to be a big piece and seeing regional collaboration. And then as an education institution, also watching and trying to learn from and being able to support those that are in challenges, but really looking at the emergency management side. We had, uh, we're looking forward to investing as much time and resources into uh, to our institution here at the Emergency Training Center to support municipal emergency management training as well. So as municipalities continue to get stressed and worked and realizing, hey, that's things we need to be doing and getting people prepared that hopefully I'm right there with some resources and some educational programs that we can quickly, you know, get municipalities up to speed or get people qualified that we can again be relied on as that municipal training resource for them. So I think there's that. And then making sure that uh, we're, we're trying to have conversations with the province of Alberta and Alberta Emergency Management Agency also is to leverage us as a resource, whether it be with our trucks or equipment or students or staff is recognize us as that so we can go out and help support, but also if you can give us resources that I can use here to train students, but also make them ready for deployment um, when an emergency comes, I can also support that. Um, so for example, let's say a, a sprinkler trailer, if it's here, I can use it to train on 365 days a year, but I can also make sure that it's available, available for deployment. Um, that when you know um, Whitehorse is calling or Yellowknife is calling or or Medicine Hat's calling, that that resource can be on the road out to them, hopefully immediately from us, and it doesn't cause extra stress in the system trying to get it out from somewhere else or another municipality if things are ready to hear. Um, again, trying to bring that presence on that we're a provincial and national resource to 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 Canada and Alberta. Now, the EGC is celebrating a big anniversary this year, 59 years in operations. Correct me if I'm wrong, if I got that number right. I think it's 59, 65. 65, 65 years. 65, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> 65 years in operation. Um, you have, uh, the organization has seen ebbs and flows. Or you have seen good the good the highs and the lows when it comes to wildfire seasons and the firefighter seasons. What does the ETC have in store for this upcoming year? Because while we can talk about wildfires, but is there anything coming down the pipeline for ETC? Is there anything coming down from Lakeland College to ensure that you're always evolving and adapting to the ever-changing uh, atmosphere that is firefighting? Absolutely. I think the, uh, I, I would, well, I kind of jokingly say I'd love for to be able to announce all sorts of great provincial synergies and strategies. Just do and it on the show and then people will have to do it because we'll say, well, he said it. So he has to be true. <laughs> We're getting millions and millions of dollars. No, um, to support training. No, we'd love to do that. Um, we'd love for, uh, we look forward to hopefully being engaged in, in many of those conversations at the provincial and federal level, what we, whatever we can do to support things. Um, we we uh, have been talking with a few different things, like you said, some of those synergies and opportunities that we could do in collaboration. So I, I hope that we can continue to strengthen some of those partnerships that we've, we've been talking with, but we've been really trying to work with other, you know, even vendors, uh, like I'll pick on like the Petzl Climbing Company or Dragger Person Protective Equipment Company, or um, there's a few other ones and just trying to create that awareness on what the utility is that we have here and the amount of infrastructure we have here and trying to establish those partnerships because if if partnership comes to me and and whether it be money or in kind or whatever it means is i can take that money and reinvest it back into our programming and back into our students that's the i think the beauty of the the public education system at the post-secondary level and you know essentially we're a non-profit so the more stuff i can get the more i can have an impact on students um in the end getting people more prepared so again this spring also we're looking at running out 
a couple more wildland firefighting courses because again there's going to be a need for those so if we can get it in another another batch of say 60 people trained in the next six weeks awesome let's get them out in the workforce to to get jobs and get get going on that sort of thing um still running our pre-employment programs this summer um, but also try to create that education that we're here as a resource please let us know what you need um, we're happy to engage in those conversations and do whatever we can kind of thing. Um, and then look to, you know, continue just to promote that uh, we've been here for 65 years. It's uh, like I said, I always applaud municipal affairs for the, and, and the, the visionary thinkers that we had back in the fifties and sixties and seventies that built the, this institution to what it is. Um, and I know in the early 2000s, they had a big investment strategy planned for this facility, even to almost double its size. Um, that unfortunately didn't get through. Um, it, the plan got shelved, um, but going, wow, this would, this would have been amazing to have that sort of thing. But um, yeah, we look forward just to continuing to you know fight the good fight kind of thing and, and, and help out our municipalities as they go into a, an eventful spring. So before we wrap up, I've got to sort of ask you to plug the college a little bit, but where can people learn more? How can people reach out to you? How can CAOs, municipal leaders reach out to you and say, maybe we should have a conversation with Sean to talk about how we can get our firefighters into a training course with you? Or is there a program that we can get the Lakeland College and the ETC to partner with our municipality to ensure that we are better prepared for any upcoming emergency uh, that we may have? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, uh, Lakeland County, or Lakeland College, two municipalities, like said, from this world, Lakeland County, lakelandcollege.ca um, is, is our home for everything there. Uh, the Emergency Training Center, you'll find that within the site there. But uh, the easiest way is, again, give us a shout or shoot me an email. It's sean.mccary at lakelandcollege.ca. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on Instagram. Um, all of that, please reach out. Like you said, we have some great experts. Um, I'm also not afraid to tell people how it is now that most of the time it's easier to, you know, for employees to tell council or our mayors, you know, be a little bit softer about things or not, or I can, I'm happy just to, you know, tell you the truth. There's, you know, if, if that makes sense, right? I'm not uh, I'm not bound by certain things, I suppose, to a degree, um, but I'm here to help. And that's the thing in the end is that I will, you know, give you what you need to get best prepared or, or give you the advice that you're looking uh, or that you need. Um, definitely just want to be that resource for us. So you reach out that way and we're happy to engage. I'm I'm happy to jump on the road. We spent a, a great night um, a, a couple months ago in, in Camrose working with their fire department in the library at the school. It was just, hey, can you come out and talk about, you know, teams and how to create an effective team? And we spent the evening with them and uh, a colleague of mine that work here, we just hit the road. And what, what do you guys want to do? She said, well, we'll just come out. We'll have some fun kind of thing. Just uh, reach out. Um, now you look at the bigger picture and again, like you said, as a first responder, municipal employee at heart, um, that's where you know my love is, and I uh, look forward to again that, to support that sector uh, through my role here. So the links to Lakeland College, the emergency training centers, social media pages, and Sean's email address will be in the show notes. If you're listening to this on any of the podcast of apps, head over to our website and make sure you check out the uh, episode with Sean. And it will be linked in the show notes there and on the website. Sean, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for taking an hour out of your time to sit down and talk about the upcoming wildfire season, how municipalities can be prepared, but also the state of municipalities, uh, the fire, the state of wildfire uh, fighters and the emergency training center. It is always appreciated to talk to someone who is as passionate as municipalities as I am. So thank you. Just a reminder that all the links that we mentioned today in today's episode will be in the show notes below if you are watching this on YouTube. If you're not and you're only listening to this on the audio platforms, head over to the Cross Border Interviews website and check out the show notes there. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed 
and engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.